over the internet. As an independent, non-partisan policy research think tank, we are engaged with India's relationship with the world, transforming how India is governed and exploring the intersection of technology, economics, and politics. You can take a look at our public policy education programs that are tailored specifically for people like you. They're all online and you can take it from anywhere. We have both short one semester certificate programs as well as year long graduate programs in public policy, defense and foreign affairs and technology policy. Admissions are now open for the next intake. To connect with us, please subscribe to our newsletters and podcasts. Depending on your interest, we deliver sharp and timely analysis that allow you to reduce the information overload and get to the heart of the matter. On that note, Nitin, I will hand it over to you. Please take this conversation forward. Uh, thank you, Mahek. Uh, it's really a delight to be uh, in this conversation with Nandan and Tanuj. Uh, and, uh, you know, these, these gentlemen need no introduction at all. So I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, do that. Uh, but uh, this is a conversation about uh, the book which they've uh, published recently uh, called The Art of Pitfulness. And I want to preface the conversation by making some points that are relevant to us in the public policy community, because most of us, uh, you know, some of you are alumni, some of you are joining us from the net. But if you are joining a Takshashila conversation, it's because you're interested in public policy. So uh, I just want to bring in the public policy dimensions of this uh, before we uh, uh, get our great authors to weigh in and talk about the book. I think the first point, uh, there are three broad points I want to make. The first point is about the internet and the information age. Now, those of us who uh, got onto the internet uh, many, many years ago, you know, in the early 90s or maybe in the 80s, we, you know, the, the, the general feeling among us who are on the technical side of things that we felt that the world would be a better place, it will be more peaceful, and more understanding if we could get everyone to communicate with each other. You know, our, our, as engineers, we felt that the communication barrier is the is the problem which uh, you know which is the root of many world many of the world's policy and public uh, public policy and <laughs> political problems. And then the second thing is if you talk to people like John Gilmore, uh, he said that the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. You know. So there was this feeling that the internet is going to be this liberating technology, which will lead to greater uh, understanding between human societies, human communities, and will also empower the individual against uh, the state, big corporations, etc., by you know making it a freer, uh, making the world a freer place. Both have been proven to be questionable at best and very wrong at worst, right? So that's one thing. So we've arrived at a conclusion where our early thoughts about what the internet would do to human society uh, have been uh, are very questionable today. The second is from a public policy point of view, it's to do with the effect it's had on democracy and uh, markets, right? Democracy now, for example, is as good as its discourse. This is one of the things, those of you who are in Takshashila, you know, you start off knowing that uh, democracy is as good as its discourse. So if you want to improve the quality of democracy and governance outcomes, you must improve discourse. Unfortunately, though, in the last 15 years, you've seen that social media has destroyed uh, uh, any kind of high quality public discourse in a, at a mass level. Maybe it happens at small pockets, but in a, you know, at a global level, at large scales, uh, discourse is terrible, right? So this is, has massive effects, therefore, for democracy, because how can you sustain a democracy when you can't have a good conversation uh, about things that matter? The second is concerns those of us who work in the area of information warfare. Uh, here's this idea of cognitive security, right? Just like you talk about international security, national security, there's cognitive security of the individual. Influencers are quite all right if they're encouraging you to buy shoes and stationery from small businesses. But it's entirely a different game when they interfere with the way you define yourself, the way we see right and wrong, and they prey on the instinctive parts of the brain. And we've seen political effects of this, geopolitical effects of this over the last 10 years at least, right? Which means the final point before I, I segue and bring the speakers in is that the edifice of individual rights liberal democracy and free markets rests 
on the individual's capability for reason, right? At the, that's, that's the edifice on which all of this is constructed. But Kahneman and Jonathan Haidt and others tell us that the brain doesn't work this way. You know, reason is not what it's cranked out to be. You know, you have a fast brain that jumps to conclusions and then you have a slow brain that rationalizes those conclusions. Now, what happens with social media is that it interrupts this process and privileges only the fast brains. You know, there's very little time for your slow brains to work. And a fast brain jumps from instinct to instinct, outrage to outrage. So that's why the news cycle is what it is. The outrage cycle is what it is. So there's very little time for our brains to work, uh, to think, uh, to make reasonable conclusions about small things, big things, political things, economic things, social things. And that's the context in which I found the book, The Art of Bitfulness, uh, an extremely interesting um, uh, effort or an initiative to sort of get us focused on this problem. The problem is we are not able to use technology in a way that makes our thought processes better, that makes our social outcomes better, that makes our public policy designs better. Now, at Takshashila, we have had a little framework which we teach to uh, you know, uh, sort of handle this problem, but I won't go into it. We'll let this author speak first. And I think, it's entirely up to the authors how they want to talk about it. Uh, but before I go, there's one little thing. We have five signed copies of the book that will be given away to folks, participants who use the Q&A uh, platform to make the best points as succinctly as possible. Right. So there are two conditions. The quality of the point you make must be good and it should be as succinct as possible. So no one here has time to read a uh, PhD thesis in the chat screen. So try to make it, and those of you who are from Takshashila, remember the reverse Bollywood format, right? Just, just make sure that you make it as succinct as possible and frame your uh, sentence. So it's in a way, it's also an educational process uh, on how you frame your questions and your points. Uh, don't worry, it's a Q&A, but you can make comments as well. So comments, questions, both welcome. Five, five signed copies will be given away uh, at, towards the end of the conversation. So without further ado, just let me... Uh, bring uh, Nandan to talk uh, about the book uh, and why as one of the main culprits who got the Indian IT industry off uh, and made IT a household uh, name and an aspiration for so many of us, why is it that he became a, a co-culprit in writing this book? Uh, and uh, you know what, what does he think of this uh, issue in terms of uh, the challenge of dealing with tech? Uh, he, I must start with a full disclosure. Nandan is uh, both a donor to Takshashila and a personal mentor. So if I, you know, if I give him low, uh, slow and low underarm, uh, what slow underarm balls, then you know why I'm doing that. So over to you, Nandan. Thanks, uh, Nitin, and it's great to be here on this uh, Takshashila platform. First of all, let me clarify. I am a huge believer in the power of technology for doing good. And I've been at this game for 40 years, both in terms of helping companies transform themselves with digital technology in my role at Infosys, and also how nations can change and use technology for uh, more equitable growth in my role in Aadhaar and UPI and so on. So I'm a big believer in technology for good. So let me, this book is not an anti-tech book by any means. But this is specifically about what's happened in the space of consumer technology in the last 10 to 12 years, where the internet, when it internet was starting, internet was not designed to be a commercial platform. It was really designed as either from the US DOD as a way to be a fail safe network or really designed by engineers and technologists. It didn't have a business model. And then the business model that actually arrived after Netscape and then all the other net internet companies began was advertising led. And advertising means you need to capture the attention of the user because the more, more you engage them, then the more time they spend on your app. And therefore you can show them the ads and then the more you know about their behavior, the more you can you know, point the right ads to them and so on. So that what we call is the original sin then led to all the other issues. And even the polarization of social media is the consequence of the fact that they realize that if you create this filter bubble and keep feeding this guy stuff that he already believes in, that he'll make him further angry and he gets more engaged. 
So ultimately, all of it flows from that. So that's the part that we are talking about, how we came about to that situation, what can we do as individuals to deal with that situation, and what can societies think about as collective solutions. So I'm very much pro-tech. I'm very much, uh, you know, this book is about how people can be, uh, calmer and better and how societies can re-engineer tech so we don't really have a winner-take-all model in everything. Uh, okay, but then uh, Nanad, how would you characterize the problem? I mean, at the, at the largest level, right, the, the problem which you try to solve in the art of wakefulness, what's the big problem here at the, at the biggest level? No, no, see, it's it's what we call as the third crisis, right? We know that the pandemic was one kind of a crisis, a crisis which came about due to some virus and the whole world was essentially shut down for two years. And we, you know, and we all recognize this crisis because it affected our daily lives. And, uh, it, you know, we couldn't meet people. We And we obviously use a lot more digital technology. And for such a crisis, we have a set of individual solutions and a set of collective solutions. So individual solutions in the pandemic is that you wear a mask, you practice social distancing and you know meet people in open spaces and so on. The collective solution is how do we uh, you know have a vaccine strategy so everybody's vaccinated and, and how do societies improve public health and sanitation. So there is a individual solution for, for a, a, a virus pandemic and there's a collective solution. The same is true of the other big challenge the world is facing of climate change. At the individual level, we want to reduce our carbon footprint. We want to use less meat, which is much more carbon intensive and many other things that people do, and then, uh, fly less or whatever. And there is a collective solution of bringing carbon taxes or converting the world to renewable energy. So the, the, and the, the climate crisis also has these two things, an individual solution and a collective solution. And we think the digital situation is, in a way, the third crisis, which is, you know, billions of people spending a lot of time on apps that are designed to engage them. And therefore, we felt we must explain why we are where we are, which is the first part of the book, how we came to the situation. What can we as individuals do to deal with this so that we are on top of it so that we can be calmer and more productive, which is equivalent to wearing a mask in a vaccine. And what can societies do to reorganize or rejig the technology to be much more interoperable and much more portable so that we have much more choice and freedom for clients, uh, for, uh, for uh, choice and freedom for companies and innovation can flurry. So think of it like that, that every crisis has an individual solution and a collective solution. And we are proposing the individual and collective solution for the digital consumer usage crisis and we also explain how we came to where we are. Right. So I'll 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 uh, uh, I'll pick your mind a little bit more on those things uh, a little later. But I just want to talk to Tanuj first. Tanuj, a lot of this book is your personal journey, right? Uh, in a sense that you got from one place, uh, you realized that there is something wrong with the place they were in, and then you went through a journey and sort of uh, you know something woke up inside you then you said look we've got to do something about this so can you take us through that journey i think that that uh, that will be of great interest to a lot of us because i mean we are all in the same boat you know literally yeah, yeah. No, no. dealing with the same challenges what made you you know just describe the journey for us oh sure so uh, i think there are two levels of this right one is more immediate in the book but also in my career uh, where i've been going with this uh, which i think would be more relevant for the audience so i'll start with that with bigger story context um, I used to build and fly drones at some point in time, uh, you know, I, I got fascinated by these things, 2014 actually, um, uh, and started building drones uh, and we had a great business, was doing very well, uh, except in October of that year, there came a ban on all use of all drones, all the thing, right? If you own a drone, you're a criminal, right? Uh, it's just a memo, it didn't have, now I understand these things, it didn't really have force of law or anything behind it. But the DGCA tried to stop that. And I tried to solve this problem. I tried to show up to the DGCA, knock on doors, talk to people, see what could be done. Um, and I was utterly incompetent at it, right? Like my brain was unable to comprehend how this even works, uh, why are they not listening to me? I'm making such eloquent points out of that. Um, and, and clearly that didn't work, right? 2014, 15, 16, sort of the business goes through ups and downs for this reason. 
and therefore i decide that okay i have failed miserably i have learned that there is this wall i can't climb so let me go find people who are good at getting a uh, new sort of technology and technology policy across in the government and that's how i end up at i spirit uh, where i meet nandan etc and there i sort of started having this moment um of learning that you know i i clearly love technology like somebody who wants to build drones and whatever programming before that um i clearly love this i love this thing this idea of building etc but i feel like i had been sort of you know blinded to just or uh, very very focused on this only one style or si- uh, way of building technology which is your classic startup vc shark tank you know that that um, hype um whereas when you came to ice spirit you realized that you know, building things like upi what nandan has done with aadhar that's another way of building technology and that building technology actually has the kind of things that we all claim when we start up claim you have impact you have growth you have whatever i think that i experienced at ice spirit um you start doing this work it's it involves a lot of different uh, you know take a lot of bed time it is three different policy projects because they all take time right so you want to make sure that you're uh, doing a few things so that um uh, people are uh, you know always so I mean, something is always going this is where this combined with the pandemic becomes very very overwhelming very very fast right because in that uh, period when we're all locked in we're all like glued to our screens uh, you know the uncertainty in work has increased even more and you're trying to push things it just felt like uh, you know like i was trapped by my devices i felt like i was in this um you know like i was charmed almost like a snake charmer and i couldn't look away um and nandan um, you know uh, he started these walks in the park basically because he also once we figured out little time had passed we figured out that mask and social distancing kind of works um uh, post the first wave we sort of nandan started doing these walks in the park and uh, in one of those conversations i think when we had some spare time so you know i just sort of told him that we, we really appreciate that this is walk and like going out and actually meeting somebody in person right like that's just like doing that started feeling so good and uh, and uh, nandan said the same thing and i was as, as i'm sure all of you are surprised to hear that even he goes through this right because i felt like i'm going through this i first blamed myself um but then hearing that even even nandan is susceptible to this idea etc got us thinking that this is something larger than you know just a it's not just a tech problem it's not just a techy problem it's, it seems to be a widespread problem the more people we spoke to the more people agreed that uh, they feel the same uh, can't look away right and losing our time kind of problem uh, that's where we started sort of uh, you know then we started talking solutions and we realized that even the solutions that we've come up with are similar nandan has been using them for many years so so we tried to distill all that put it into the book but we also wanted to combine it with you know and relate it to all the work we've been doing so far uh because these are two sides of the same problem you you asked this question up front right like um sort of this this individual sovereignty and how it's affecting the quality of discourse right uh, fast paced slow brain uh, you're you're absolutely right right technology when it started or or when computers started were supposed to be like calculators they were supposed to do things for you that you couldn't do so enhance your brain and i would say they were like that till the 80s early 90s right it's when the logic of the internet comes in when the logic of the internet embeds and then slowly takes over all of personal computing the logic of the internet uh, you know and now they try to uh, dismiss it as web 2 uh, is that there are these centralized companies which actually had the ability to make money so the way they designed the internet the services we get on the internet everything else is essentially designed to feed their goals now which in an early stage they may do it align with the user goals you know give you what you want give it for free etc to get that growth but as they become bigger their goals and society's goals diverge right they will look out for their best interest facebook will go for engagement not disclose that you know we know that uh, instagram is hurting uh, self confidence in young teenage girls right these interests diverge and because there is no oversight there is no power that we have over these companies uh, you can't get them to come back or converge on the society and we talk about that i i'm i'm hoping around and this is my work at icepirit as well um you know i'm i'm i hope i've converted uh, so converged those two streams of thought uh, into something coherent yeah you know but tanuj uh, yeah okay that's 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 one part uh, let me just quickly 
sort of make a tangential or I don't know, it's not exactly tangential, somewhat related, is bitfulness suggests bits and mindfulness, right? And, yeah. and, and you, you sort of allude to this. Uh, so is this book written with a purpose to create the same kind of uh, uh, sort of thought process as mindfulness is to, uh, you know, concentration, mental health, uh, peace and so on? Is that the is that the metaphor? I mean, is the is the metaphor intended for that? The yeah, the metaphor is you know uh, two things. One is yes, being mindful about your technology. So it's it's mindful in the digital realm because I, I would say the the biggest problem is we are mindlessly scrolling. Most of us are you know like just doing this or it's become a habit that you don't even have reasons to. Uh, if you're a smoker, you might recognize this feeling, right? Sometimes you don't even realize when you lit that cigarette, right? It's it's after you've done it that you realize, oh, why am I here? Why am I doing this, right? Um, I think for all of us, technology has become like that. Uh, we're checking our mail or checking our feeds for no reason. So it's a mindfulness about your bits, but it's also the idea that it's only a bit of mindfulness, right? Like, because if you were to, in, in computers, as opposed to say, uh, you know, mental health, uh, and so regular practice, because you're trying to embed a habit into your own brain, uh, with technology, if you can design your system around it, you can actually sort of, you know, you know, it's just code at the end of the day, it's very malleable. You can get your system, your OS, the tools you use to be, or choose them to be something that, you know, helps you in the long run without that much effort. So that was the, that was the play there. Um, but yeah, the solution, like you said, is sort of, you know, the, the underlying thing that we wanted to distinguish from is, this is not about some moral superiority, oh, I am better because I don't use technology. Nandan and I, Personally, you would never subscribe to that, both of us. It's also not that big tech is evil, right? It's it's finally coming down and saying that calmness is a virtue for yourself, right? And the world is not going to give it to you. So you have to take it back. The, yeah, the reason I asked this, you know, we discovered this, uh, especially early part of the pandemic, mm -hmm. that, you know, Takshashila's courses, most of our lectures have been uh, online, right? We've been doing webinar-based teaching since 2010. So uh, it's 2020 when the whole world catches up. And then we realize that everybody is on a webinar, you know. So yeah. nobody is coming to the Takshashila class. And the Takshashila class is not like a great new experience, right? People yeah. have just been bored to death with a webinar and here's another webinar. Yeah. So, and, and it was the same for, the, for us faculty also. You know, we're going to teach. I mean, we've done this and uh, this another one. So what we did at that point is we introduced a mindfulness uh, uh, bracket uh, before each class. So what happens is now when and I'm giving away Takshashila secret sauce, but we actually start every webinar with a structured mindfulness session. It's about two to three minutes. The program managers were very, very angry with me when I said this because every minute is spoken for and I'm yeah. taking three minutes now. Right. Yeah. So if yeah. I take three minutes. So when you start the session, you actually do mindfulness, you know, breathe in, breathe out, uh, that kind of thing, Bring get, get yourself into the room. And what we found in post-class uh, surveys is that this has helped them a lot. You know, to a lot of people, it looks very cheesy. You know, as in breathe in, breathe out, you know, you know what this kind of, you know. I mean, even I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a skeptic of everything, right? So, yeah, yeah. even a skeptic, like if you had told me in 2019 that breathing in, breathing out two minutes before a webinar makes a difference, I would have said, come on, you know, this is, this is just nonsense, right? But uh, it, it has helped people. And yeah. we've seen qualitative improvements in learning. So there is something to, I mean, uh, the reason I like the book, I saw it first in the Bangalore Lit Fest. I mean, it said it's keeping calm in a digital world. There is something which really struck me, right? That the calmness uh, from one perspective, that is being peaceful, calm is one way. The other kind of calmness is the kind of calmness that allows you to think rationally, right? Uh, so that you, you're not, you're not, you know, it's not a spiritual calmness. It's like a mental calmness that allows you to sit back and say, hey, let me weigh the pros and cons. Yeah. Uh, Nandan, if, if I were to take this forward and, you know, you mentioned that there are individual strategies and social strategies. And, uh, you know, you mentioned also, you know, you're, you have these three ways of dealing with, uh, you know, your life hack of three ways of doing with, uh, dealing with the creation mode and curation mode. Can you share with us how you do that? That's I think I as a as a takeaway, I found that extremely so many of us were doing something like this, but none of us yeah. had actually thought consciously about this. Yeah. So uh, uh, two things. One is mine evolved over time because all these technologies came to me at different points in my life. So you know, I got my desktop at 
in my 40s. I probably got my laptop in my mid 40s. I got my smartphone in my mid 50s. So, you know, whereas Tanoj got it at 15 or something. So, you know, it's two different things. So, my approach has been a hardware approach to this. And basically, we talk about three states. Of One is the the, curate, the uh, create stage or create use of technology where you need to do deep thinking, you need to write articles and stuff like that, where you don't want to be interrupted. You want it to be, your mind can should be completely focused on doing those things. Then we have the curate stage where you browse around, read things or watch things. And then we have the communicate uh, a sort of thing where you do communicate with people. He has his own uh, attributes. So I do these on three different devices, uh, Nitin. I, ha I do all my create work on my laptop. And my laptop is in a nice space with lighting and books and so on. And when I sit at the laptop, my, my mental model is already about working and being you know, thoughtful about things. When I do the curate phase, I do only on my iPad. So on my iPad, when I pick it up, I know I'm going to be browsing articles or whatever. And I only do communication on my phone. So my phone is only picked up to talk to people or send messages. I don't use any social media. I fundamentally don't use anything when an algorithm is feeding me things. And that's a simple philosophy I have. I want stuff which comes in chronological order, which is why I like to use my SMS because it comes in the sequence in which people gave it to me. There's nothing else. So what happens is that I do use Twitter, but more as a distribution mechanism of stuff that I so now in the real world, how does it work? In the real world, you when you go to a library, you go to work. <laughs> you know, you, you know, everything is quiet and you read a book or you write. When you go to a pub, you go to socialize. You have a drink and talk and maybe speak loudly and all that. When you go to a park, you exercise. You walk or run and breathe the fresh air and listen to the birds. So in the physical world where we are, we immediately we switch the context to that thing. In the digital world, unfortunately, there is no boundaries. And therefore, you in the same device, you're writing an article, the uh, Slack is beeping, the WhatsApp messages are coming, somebody is sending something polarizing, you're getting upset. That's, a, that's not going to work. So my model is simple. I sit at the laptop to work, I sit with my iPad to browse, and I use my phone to communicate. And therefore, the moment I pick up that device, I know what I'm getting into. And essentially, Tanush does the same, but He's a more modern guy. He's half my age, so he does everything on his desk, on his phone. But he creates different worlds or different systems, and that's what this book describes: how to create those systems. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll interrogate uh, Tanuj in a while. But mm -hmm. Nandan, how would you handle a situation where, let's say, you you are uh, doing creating on your laptop, and your phone starts ringing, or you get an SMS? I don't keep my phone near me when I'm working on my laptop. And it's the same when you're on on, uh, on you know, iPad also. No, with iPad it's less because I'm not doing that int mind intensive work on iPad. I'm maybe reading some articles or something or uh, watching something. So that's okay. But I keep my phones away from me because the very fact that the phone is nearby and and I, all my notifications are on silent. I don't want some beep beep going all the time. I find it very distracting. So I keep the devices away. Even if they anyway close, they're on silent mode, so I can give complete undivided attention to what I'm doing at that point. And I reward myself at the end of that. So suppose I have to write 100 words of an article. I say that after the 100 words, I'll play free cell or go to the Twitter feed. So I reward myself after finishing that work. And, and I suppose, I don't know whether you get that, but most of us get phone calls from someone saying, do you want to sell your car or... You want to refinance your car and insurance and all that. I don't take calls from any uh, a number which is not in my contact list. No question. So okay. I, I know it's really, you may think I'm some old fashioned guy or something, but it works very well. I'm very calm. I'm on top of my work. I'm on top of my technology. Okay. I'll, I'll share with you my life hacks a little later, but let's, let's interrogate Tanuj. Tanuj, you know, you've been put in a spot by saying, look, boss, you're, you're half his age, right? That means you are sort of a digital native. Now, I do have another challenge, which is like people like my kids who are born after the smartphone, you know, yeah. uh, or at least in the smartphones. So they've never, you know, for them sending a 40 meg attachment to, a, to something is like normal. And I, and I squirm when I see a 40 MB thing coming on my messaging. It's like, how the hell could you send 40 MB, right? <laughs> but but they, they, they are okay. 
So th that's a different story. But you yeah. you are somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. Do you still have that same hardware method which Nandan uses, or do you have something else? No, I think uh, what worked for me is um, you know, there is a there is a distinction between my phone and my laptop for sure in in the hardware that uh, I realized that my phone is a device that I want to use only when I am on the go. Like I aspire to not have to use my phone when I am uh, in my desk quarters. So it's configured that way. But everything I do, I try to do it through uh, different identities of the computer and different identities, uh, you know, across on my uh, cell phone number, etc. So I don't know how many of you know about the service called Dusra. It gives you a virtual number. Um, so I have switched, you know, and this is like the so I think people have generally stopped calling my age also and anybody younger than me, I don't think they've ever placed a phone call. Like I, I they don't be called customer care if at all. Um, um, once I switched out my Sugi and my Danzo and all of them also to uh, do so, I pay like getting a call now is an event, right? I, I mean, I sometimes get a call. Um, that's how it is. So identity is one on your computer. Most people don't think about this, but you can create a new user on your computer. If at all you've done this, you've probably done this for home or work. But what Nandan and I recommend is that try doing it for a create, curate, and communicate. Because you know what we were studying earlier, that to create that environment on your digital environment on your computer where you're focused is much easier if you have a new user account. And a new user account simply don't install all of the things that you think you need. Like don't install email, don't install WhatsApp. On that, just open up, you know, like I'm guessing all of you have to write policy briefs. On that user account, just have Word or whatever you, you know, your note tool that you write in. And uh, that's it. It's, it's that simple, you know, that temptation is simply not there. And you can, so on my computer, I have a writer Bhojwani and, and the account that I'm using right now, uh, which is Tanuj Bhojwani, which is where I communicate, which is where, you know, WhatsApp, Zoom, all these things are, email is. Um, and I try to spend as little time in this profile as possible. So now it's a different challenge. So because if I can just quickly come in, you know, triage my messages, quickly get done with it, move out, um, you know, then that's, that's the best day. Right, that I have, uh, where I'm not spending any time here. Um, and then the rest, you know, like my phone is a little bit like my phone also allows different user accounts, but it's a little bit of a hodgepodge because sometimes you need your WhatsApp and you need things on the go. So I do get mixed up, but my phone is where I do what Nandan is saying, right? Like I, I'll sit back somewhere and just scroll and like what he uses iPad, but I do have WhatsApp, which is my biggest sin, I guess, uh, you know, on my phone. And if you look at my screen time, you know, everything else is less than 10, 20 minutes. Uh, including YouTube, I don't watch, I watch Sudoku, but my WhatsApp time is sometimes three, four hours. And I think that's because if you get a WhatsApp call, it counts that also. So, But Tanuj, I, I, I see that you're sitting on a gamer's chair. So yes. where's the gaming, the Bhojwani? Does it have there's, a no, there's, no, there's no gaming, this is just a very good chair. I'm sorry, uh, you know, I think we have flashed the logo also. So in case you're looking for a chair recommendation. Uh, is actually you have to sit on our, uh, so the other thing, you know, that happened with me in that year of writing the book is I got a little bit of, I got carpal tunnel on the right hand. So started realizing that it is kind of important to make sure that, you know, um, uh, all of this is correct. So my whole setup also includes a keyboard tray so that I'm not like squinching, like, you know, it's, it's more natural, relaxed level. All of that is critical, um, you know, and I hope all of us, uh, I'm hearing of a lot of golfers elbows these days because people are just simply holding their phone stiff. Um, the doctor that I went to told me there's a lot more of this neck pain, etc. So please take care of that. You know, also we've not written about it in the book because it gets very prescript prescriptive, which we didn't want to do. But um, I'm sure that all of you are going to face these problems. Yeah, ergonomics is important. But Tanuj, on hmm. the phone itself, hmm. uh, would it? Because a lot of people now I see are phone first. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, laptops and uh, iPads are just like sort of secondary or tertiary devices. But on the phone itself, will you be able to do the create curate? Uh, so on create? Android phones, you can. Um, again, it really depends on the manufacturer because you know Android is, uh, you know, like the base Android allows you to have user accounts. Um, your particular manufacturer may or may not implement it. I personally use the cheapest phones that I can find because for this reason, right? I use the real me so that I am no longer, you know, carried away by the fancy features of my phone and doing what I. Firstly, you think that's one place where you can save more time and money. You just take the, take the worst phone possible, you will spend less time on it, right? Like it is just a bad experience. So while they're trying to sell you faster and cheaper phones and smoother screens, don't. Like just, you know, like Nandan, I, I genuinely have come down to using uh, my phone mostly for WhatsApp. And if I need to look up a fact very quickly, etc. 
uh, the harder you make it for yourself to watch YouTube and the screen is smaller and all of that, you know, you'll spend less time on it. Again, these things are not inaccessible to you. We're not saying give them up. We're saying that if you have to, if you put that friction in your own environment, that you have to go and do it on a computer and go and do it there, you will just use your time better, which is what we are hoping you will do. Okay. I just want to go back to Nandan about this. You know, Nandan, you guys were thinking about this problem at the same time as Xi Jinping. You know, and, and <laughs> Xi Jinping decided, Xi Jinping decided, hey guys, you people are spending too much time on, I'm going to implement national screen time. You know, uh, you can't have more than 90 minutes of screen time during the week or whatever. So that's, I mean, I think, I think. That's for I kids, yeah, that's for kids. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a matter of time before he elevates uh, the whole thing for the rest of. I mean, maybe after this party congress, he'll do this for adults also. But 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 more seriously, uh, the question really is: How do we make this disperse through the population at scale, right? And scale is what you also is one of your you know big ways of thinking about things. Is how do we make these ideas of bitfulness or the you know mindful use of technology scale? at sort of India levels. And it's still at an individual thing. I'm not talking about the social aspect of it. I'm no, I think that's a great question. And I haven't thought deeply enough about it. Uh, we, we, of course, thought that we should put the idea out and make people realize. But but I think there, maybe the apps also have to, I mean, it's, it's, it's beyond individuals to do that. The, the platform themselves will have to do that in the long-term interest of the health of the clients. But I mean, they do some of that, for example, you get a weekly update on how much time you spend. You can put a you can put a restraint on how much time, and then it will tell you that you spend. There, there are those, but ours is. But I don't think we are not seeing too much. Maybe Tanush can correct me about these modes of working and being able to switch modes. That's that we think is a new idea that we have introduced. So I haven't seen enough, but maybe devices or apps should provide that too. Right, so like there's a, a create profile and a communicate profile. Yeah. And so on. Uh, yeah, uh, you know the 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 other angle to this is if you look at most technologies, like let let's look at cars, right? Uh, it's usually the family, the parent who tells the kid the responsible use of a car, right? Because the car was with you know is, was with the parent before the kid got it. Okay. But also, the kid gets the car only when he has a driving license at sixteen or eighteen. Yeah. At sixteen or eighteen, right? So the, there's a norms of that. Not getting the car to drive at five years. <laughs> but here you have the opposite situation where I don't think there is a body of adults, which is, I mean, we don't have a large number of adults who can really uh, speak with experience and authority about the kind of technology the kids and the younger people are using, right? So it's a sort of inversion uh, effect. Yeah. And, and sometimes what the adults tell the kids are probably the opposite. You know, it's like, uh, you know, one of the conversations my wife and I have always had for the last 10 years is at what time do you want them to be using phones and the internet, right? Uh, I come from a side which says, look, uh, the earlier they get it, the better, because they have to deal with this world, right? So it's 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 easy for them to, uh, I mean, they've been digital natives, they, they'll they know all, they'll make all their mistakes when they're kids, so that they don't make those big mistakes when they're adults. But my, Priya's point is that, look, uh, you, you're giving this very dangerous thing in the hands of kids who don't know how to use it. And here's, here's a new rule, right? But whenever we try and sort of offer a rule, we get a pushback because the kids say, look, you don't know, you don't know what you're talking about, right? Things are different now. How, how would we, you know, at a family, at a individual level, deal with this? No, I think while things are different and, you know, we, we, know, we may not know how to play Roblox or Fortnite, I think uh, some rules of the game are still valid. I mean, you know, screen time, you can definitely limit. You can, you can, you know, you, you, you can configure the, uh, the device to, limited uh, you know apps you can say make sure that uh, you use uh, apps which only have which have you know child uh, ch child worlds that they can create so so i don't see i mean just because there's some fancy app doesn't mean that you let go yeah you you have to because as i said these things are entering your mind right and that's why we have to be very careful that we we do things in a way that people are able to keep their calmness and, and balance. I mean, that's very important. I mean, a huge part of the problem today we have is because people have become polarized. They have lost their sense of balance. They live in a filter bubble. They, they get stuff to uh, send to them, which only confirms their recency bias or whatever. And, and, and it's in the mess we have now. So 
I think I think uh, at least we owe it to our kids to make sure that we some ground rules like this are laid, and I don't think it's wrong at all. Uh, I, I I want to share something with you, and I think Nandan also uh, haven't gotten the chance to interact with him, but I am surprised at the number of people who are uh, younger who are taking to this book because I had. You know the way that uh, Nitin you said it, right? Like Nandan said me is half his age. I look at people who are twenty-one today, and I just don't understand. And you know, like what they do and what is happening, and the, even the language they speak sometimes, I have zero idea. You know, like I'm making do with like understanding half the words. Um, but I'm surprised by how many of them, even during the research for the book, and even after now, who bother to read it, uh, are coming back and saying. Man, I needed this book for you know, like, I had somebody at twenty one told me, why did I not find this book earlier? And and my reaction was, how much earlier, right? So twenty one is early enough, it's, if you ask me. Um, so uh, I feel like I think the answer is that I, I'm starting to realize that people who are below in that teenage and in that age group are doing this because social, right, is very important to them. If, if you read like um, Behave by Sapolsky, etc., also talks about that the adolescent mind. This is geared too much towards what others think about them, right? And if you're in that stage, online is where the conversations are happening. Likes are the most sort of you know quantified way of thinking about whether somebody likes you or not, typically, and how much you're approved, etc. So uh, there are these very, very sort of these design paradigms that actually affect teenagers and their sense of self a lot more than they affect either of us, right? And we grow that beautiful experiment as they talked about that. You know, teenagers will take risks when they're in front of others, but not you know otherwise. Um, so you have to understand that where they're coming from is is that to them this is everything, right? So how do you how do you take them out of that, and especially how do you introduce them to other teenagers who don't think this is everything? Because I think that's the antidote, right? You can put rules and screen time and whatever. And I was a teenager not so long. I remember how you get around these things, right? I remember how you get around curfews and all of that. And all of us have done it, right? Uh, I would disbelieve you if you said you didn't try. Um, so the answer really is to expose them to somebody who does not like the, their social in that lens. If you ask me, uh, should be shown to them in other ways in other communities, and they automatically disengage. Right. Uh, let's let's move over to uh, the second set of things before we go to the Q and A. Uh, the second set of things is what Nandan mentions is the societal level uh, issues. Right now, this is an individual level problem, but societal level, uh, I mean, it's doing. Crazy things to way society works, to politics, to society, to sports, to social engagements. I mean, my first shock, I was never a great Facebook user because my first shock was he's got something called friends. And there are like 500 people who met me at some conference or something. They say, you know, send me a friend request. And my first question was, this is back in 2009, I suppose, where he says, this guy wants to be my friend. And I couldn't wrap my head around the idea that a friend is a person who, you know, I met at a conference or maybe I didn't meet at all and sends me a friend request and I become this guy's friend. I, I, you know, it, friend to me has a particular meaning, right? So, of course, I'm probably an exception because Facebook has, I mean, empirically, Facebook has billions of users. But it's doing massive changes to even things like what we define ourselves, whom we call our friend, the meaning of the word friend, right? Uh, and then, of course, politics. So what are societal rebel, uh, responses that you guys have thought of? Well, I think uh, one thing is the we, we believe that, you know, if we can make these uh, platforms much more portable and interoperable, then, you know, you, you'll be able to have new competition that comes and who will offer a different way of doing things. And those guys... Will hopefully then people will go to those platforms. So it's not a, it's a very indirect way of we are not coming from the how to solve this through regulation. You know, some people want to put constraints on uh, what these social media platforms can do. Others, uh, other people say that's a uh, affront to free speech. Then you have uh, the whole. Uh, some people feel that Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act of 1996 opened up this Pandora's box of no liability for platforms. So the whole set of people looking at it from a reg some people say that you should not allow uh, algorithmic based showing of uh, things to people that everything should be chronological. So there are many parts to that. We haven't really gone there because that's a whole new thing by itself. A general philosophy is that competition trumps regulation and create markets that uh, have many players where people can switch. Switching costs are low. 
and that will make it healthier. And that's probably more where we come from. But Tanu, you want to add? No, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that we want to put our finger on is that there is this hyper growth model of startup building that, you know, necessitates owning the network, you know, create a moat, which means own the, you know, whole set of users or own the whole knowledge or like give away things for free, subsidize so that you have this. The ad revenue model is something similar where, you know, you become the dominant search engine or you become the dominant social network by giving things for free, right? The, the, the ad revenue part of it per se is not bad because lots of things still run on ad. The Times of India, Hindustan Times, right? Whichever paper you think is credible, it still runs on ads, right? So it, it's not the ad model per se, but this the idea that the internet was about these networks. And these networks were supposed to initially be open, the IP protocol was supposed to be open. And they thought that everybody that writes on top of it will write a protocol like SMTP or email, right? But at some point in time, the business model said, no, 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 no more open protocols. We will basically close and capture. The close and capturing, then like we were talking about, leads to divergent sets of incentives for the people who are building these and for us. Um, so, you know, because there's a lot of, I see a lot of questions also about root cause and uh, I think Nitin would, would punish you for asking such a question. Right? There's never a root cause, right? It's, it's there are these multiple uh, factors that come in. But if we had to put our finger on the idea that, you know, these are all individually good ideas, like, you know, because people can't pay, why don't they do it for free or whatever. Everybody well-intentioned, well-meaning. But together, this playbook, all of these things in sequence comes in. Um, there's a chapter we call this the slippery slopes of scale. Yeah. Where this, this playbook then unfortunately leads to the same outcomes everywhere. It's, you know, monopolization, sort of cartelization, or otherwise, like, you know, just like no competition. And the hyper growth way of doing things is the only way of doing things, right? Um, just bringing in diversity of models, because we also don't know all the answers, right? We're not pitching that. But we're saying that we know that a model where the market and innovators do not have barriers to entry in coming and creating alternates um, might be a better idea. Yeah, and I, I want to go into this idea of open uh, with Nandan because, you know, in a way, there's this cyclic uh, nature of this because the internet defeated things like America Online and the French Minitel system, uh, which are all closed wa wall gardens because the internet was an open open system, right? And uh, protocols governed who could connect and how the things would talk to each other. And the idea of a URI or a URL would mean that anything that was on the net could be located uh, in one. And then now in the last five to seven years, you have, you know, WhatsApp messages, Facebook, etc., which can't be easily, which can't be addressed or can't be easily addressed uh, 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 on the internet, right? So we seem, to have, we seem to have gone back into a sort of an older cycle, which the internet defeated. Yeah. So what's the answer? How do we, I mean, in your book and in your earlier pronouncements, you've said, you know, open is the way to go. But how do we go to this open? Yeah, so basically we talk about the two things that are happening in the world. One is, of course, the crypto enthusiasts who think that uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain uh, essentially removes any centralization and it's, you know, people are in charge of their own data and so on. So that's one school of thought of how, the crypto nirvana will lead to this decentralization that Web 2.0 created. And then we have what we call as the India digital public goods model, which is all the things built in India, whether it's Aadhaar or UPI or account aggregator, or now the ONDC, which is coming, opens up for multiple players to participate in the market, reduces switching costs and creates portability. And that's the second way of thinking about it. So we talk about both these approaches and we also, for example, while the crypto guys claim that it's decentralization, actually crypto itself is very centralized. There are only a few miners who do Bitcoin. There, you know, the some one percent of the people own eighty percent of the bitcoins. You have only three or four global exchanges on which you can trade Bitcoin. So there are every everything. The thing is that while you while you can have the uh, uh, you can have the uh, uh, sort of idealism of decentralization. The reality is that all markets ultimately start re-aggregating with few players wanting to be dominant. That's the nature of markets. And therefore, you can't prevent that. But what you can do is if you can make those markets interoperable with low switching costs, at least you can hope that a new guy will come with a better solution, a better model, which will allow him to uh, take away clients from the old guy. And that's exactly what happened in Facebook and MySpace. Facebook was able to come and take over from MySpace 
often using the the you know the, the list of MySpace, but that itself they close. So now you can't have a new guy doing it, right? So opening it up, interoperability, low switching costs is the way to go. We think. Right. Uh, let me just uh, give you a uh, sort of uh, subsidiary question on that, supplementary question on that. There, there seem to be two broad models of open, right? One is the uh, old open source model where you know someone comes up with some piece of thing. There's a person who maintains it. Large number of people, uh, you know, work on that thing. Some people can fork it, etc. Right. So that's that. that that's model. for that's code. One. That's for code. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's for code. Now, for infrastructure, the kind of open, which uh, let's say uh, the India SAC or the Aadhaar model, is that there is a bunch of people who've invested time, money, money, effort into building an infrastructure which is available, and now that is open to anybody who comes, right? Yeah. So no, more than like if you look at UPI, UPI is designed to create uh, many, many payment apps. There are more than fifty apps today which offer UPI services. Uh, so, and customers can switch from one app to another app in one second. You, you, nothing. I mean, I can switch from Google Pay to WhatsApp Pay to Beam in. I can start using that. And at the back end, I can have my account in any bank. I can switch that around. And so this is a much more open thing. I mean, in the UAE, if you go to China, you basically have to choose between WeChat and uh, and uh, Alipay. And now they're trying to, you know, sort of reduce the dominance of those players with different means. So I think... It, it, the way the UPI is interoperable is an example of what is possible in a world where you lay down these rails on which everybody operates and allow them to change their providers easily. Right. So that's that. That is my question. Right. So we know the the business model and the sustainability problems of the open source uh, software model. Right. Uh, in this open uh, infrastructure model that you have been, I mean, you've pioneered. My question is. Does sustainability require government funding? That's the policy question, right? Can it operate yeah. without government funding? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 very you know finding the right balance between government markets and technological infrastructure and protocols is a very very complex exercise. In some cases, government may provide the infrastructure themselves, which is what happened with Aadhaar. In the case of UPI, there was fortunately a non-profit company NPCI set up by the banks which could provide this as an infrastructure. In the case of account aggregator, there's a framework where multiple account aggregators can be set up with regulatory approval from the RBI. In the case of ONDC, there's a new nonprofit company set up called ONDC Limited, which will have multiple shareholders who will, who will own the protocols for open commerce. So it's very difficult and it's, it, I mean, there's no, look, policy is not some cookie cutter thing here. You finally have to, and you may not get it right all the time. And But if we think through this and if we can find the right balance between markets, technology, innovators, and uh, protocols, and government, then you it's, it's, it's almost like an art to figure out exactly how to get the right balance in each sector. So, so I guess what we could say then is that the bouquet of uh, examples that you just mentioned each one seems to be a slightly different business model, right? Yeah. And we are going to see how these evolve and which one of them is going to be more sustainable. Maybe in the you know three to five year time frame, we'll know. Yeah. And some may fail also. So it's not that some may crash and burn. We, don't, we can't get everything right. But we should do this because our point is that technology has become so vital in our lives that to leave this thing unsolved is, is not a good thing. We'll end up with all the problems that we talked about, which is why we think it's an important thing to focus on. Was I will leave at six sharp. Huh? I don't know. Oh, you, you have leave at six? Yeah, five to six. Oh, I, okay. Uh, is I thought we we're going to be doing this till 6.30. So. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. I'm around. Uh, I, think I have nothing. I can answer some questions, etc. Uh, but why don't we take some crowd questions for Nandan? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so since there are a few questions, I'll bundle this in. I, I think there are two, uh, uh, since we have... Uh, Shall we then uh, close at uh, 6, uh, 6.10? Yeah, 6.10 is fine. Yeah. Okay, so let's close it at 6.10. So we'll, we'll have a chance to address all of these. Okay, so I'll divide these into two baskets. Okay, one is a basket of questions which are related to, uh, to business model, right? Which is, is it the ad revenue model? Will a subscription model work better? Will a decentralized model work better? So what are your thoughts on this? You know, 
at a what is the kind of business model we need to be looking at and second how do we get there yeah so i i think you know one thing is very clearly that the missing thing in the early internet was the transaction capability you could not make micro payments you could not pay for small things and in some sense we have solved that in india through the upi and you can now have you know 10 rupee payments at no cost and therefore in that sense i think we think india will be more a transaction economy than a than a advertising economy because advertising revenue of india is not that much uh, so i think that's one aspect the other is of course where appropriate use uh, decentralized mechanisms like blockchain and so on with the with the caveat that they also have their own internal uh, abilities to centralize and then third is creating public digital good infrastructure in sectors like Uh, financial services or e-commerce or skills or health uh, which the health stack is essentially doing that uh, or uh, account aggregators empowering data so in different sectors come up with protocols which allow you to mix and match suppliers and allow you to switch switch them very easily so the number of things that we need to think about okay there's uh, there's another question here from an anonymous attendee but i think it deserves uh, it is it's a prize kind of question right the question is really I will give the price to this anonymous attendee. We'll we'll figure out. We'll we'll uh, we'll. Uh, ah, something. you look at an IP address or something. <laughs> well, that's the next question. So you're but, getting Xi Jinping's techniques here, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, we'll ask the anonymous attendee to uh, give us the IP address and the phone number. <laughs> but but really, the person's question is interesting because what the person is asking is uh, how far is the abandonment of the chronological timeline part of. all of you know all of this uh, process and is it reversible you know can we can we go back to from this algorithmic to something like a i mean but it has to be done by regulation in no other way i mean in fact if you saw that uh, francis hagen's uh, testimony to uh, congress he talked about the fact that we should go back to chronological uh, things because the moment it's algorithmic then the filter bubble starts you get fed stuff that you uh, makes you angry or you get stuff that algorithm uh, algorithmic preferencing is the heart of the game right so but uh, why, why will a company stop doing it companies are going to stop doing it you can only do it through regulation you can you can say that all companies will have to deliver information uh, in a chronology i remember when i first started using twitter it was chronological i think when i you know 5 6 years back now all kinds of random stuff in my timeline i don't want to see this stuff here yeah? i just give it to me in time man i'll figure out you know I'll figure it out. So I think uh, that's what is happening. So I, it has to be by regulation. There's no other way to do it. You know, one of the interesting ideas that uh, uh, we at Takshila and people like Francis Fukuyama have been working on is to introduce competition at that algorithmic level. To say that uh, instead of trying to regulate Twitter or Facebook, you compel them to open up that market uh, of for algorithmic thing to various players, and then I could choose. You know, I could choose uh, vanilla. I could choose strawberry. I could choose uh, whichever is you know. Oh, I could choose chronological also as an option. So I agree. Yeah, yeah I think it's it, certainly, and I do think I'm I'm Tanuj Lohan, but I think some of the programs platforms do allow you to choose chronological, right, Tanuj? Yeah, I mean some of them do, but no, look, the idea is neither what you're saying. Uh, even if you have the algorithmic competition, how do you do that, right? How do you actually uh, uh, give somebody? uh the full freedom because look we all know real politics right let's suppose twitter owns the end user twitter owns uh, you know the the ui and the ad placement but just the feed parts of it is outsourced to one algorithm what are they going to get paid for how are they going to get measured right because uh, inherently uh, if you go from anything other than the twitter algorithm which or the facebook algorithm or instagram algorithm which have been optimized for engagement everything else will perform Worse, right? So, so the so instead of that, I think where Nanan and I come from on this is, boss. Let's ask a simple question: Who does that data belong to? My list of friends, the people I like, or what? It's mine. And if you take that individual and summation across people, it's ours, right? So if it's ours, that infrastructure and and that data at least, you know, not the servers, not whatever, but the the data and that social graph, as you call it, should be ours. Once it's ours, not just the algorithm, you can even have a different UI. What if something that only shows you ten tweets and stops? That might be a better idea, right? 
and or like your instead of a 90 minute screen time limit by uh, Mr. Chintri, you can have like a 20 tweet limit. And then those 20 tweets are selected not to enrage you, but to genuinely sort of teach you, right? Um, there could be many solutions. Why are we trying to do this? But the fundamental building block that is necessary for all these solutions is still that interoperable network. Okay. So I'll just take down to a follow-on question. I think the person, anonymous attendee, another one asks about uh, facial recognition and its effect on mindfulness uh, in our communities. But, you know, I just want to throw that into a broader question, right? Uh, as things like facial recognition come in, uh, how, how would it affect your core idea of keeping calm in a technological age? Because, you know, you're going to be watched and you're going to be watching. No, I mean, that's a larger question of the increasing surveillance uh, state. And facial recognition is one very powerful way of identifying you without you, you even knowing about it. So you could be walking in an airport and the camera could pick you up and, you know, figure out who you are. So it, it's it's part of the surveillance thing. And so I think that's a larger issue where this is just one instance of, and it is really a separate issue of how much power state should have in data collection and so on. So I think that's really not directly related to calmness. Uh, calmness is more when you are an active participant in an interaction with the device and you find uh, techniques and systems to make your interactions much more useful and productive for yourself. Right. Tanuj, this one is for you. Rohan Pai, who's, of no, who's not related to me in any way, uh, asks, uh, do customers, do consumers underestimate the magnitude at which information is shaping their views? What can be done at the individual and collective levels to address this? Uh, so, uh, I also do magic. I like it. And there's this fellow I really like, Darren Brown. And he has this uh, TV show called Push. And the thing I do with that is I turn it on and uh, it's, it's beautifully crafted. I won't give anything away. But, uh, you know, you there is a point at which I pause and I ask, would you have done this, right, to everybody? Right? And they're like, no, no, this is so to How can this happen or whatever, right? And then you, you run the uh, to the end and the finale and then they are shocked, right? Um, so the so the idea is that look, it's magicians, con men, hustlers of all sorts of all time, uh, confidence tricksters, tricksters as they're called, have been getting you to do things that you know you would not have chosen to do. This is a known vulnerability of humans, right? This is how our mind works. I mean, I don't know why you would think you are about this uh, at at all. Um, uh, like the book was mentioned, the start thinking fast, thinking slow was is essentially a compendium of all the ways in our brain does not act the way we think it does. So uh, this question to me is a very clear answer. Yes, we are all underestimating. Uh, we all have that bias towards underestimating how much other factors and random things have influence on us. What can be done to address this is, is sort of just education, right? Like, because, I mean, if you think of violence, it's it's an amazing thing. You don't think about it, it was not every day, but like this war is so tragic, it's so terrifying because violence has been reduced so much in our history through culture. Right. Um, and, and therefore we can probably, maybe there are other things we can like FOMO, we can maybe squander them out, right. If we just do the right things. Uh, thanks. Hey, so, uh, you know, I, I mentioned something about the Takshashila life hack. I just want to take two minutes to talk, to share with us, uh, with, uh, with everyone, the Takshashila life hack on this. Uh, and then uh, we will announce the winners and then we could close, right. The Takshashila, uh, okay. Someone has disabled my, the host has to enable me. Uh, so I just want to announce the names of the uh, winners in the time that it takes for someone to allow me to share. Uh, Amit Das uh, for, uh, for a fantastic question. Uh, I mean, we don't have time to uh, discuss it online here, but uh, Amit Das, Bindusri Sridhar, uh, Sridhar Krishna, of course. Uh, I'm trying not to pick the Takshashila staff here, but I can't help but uh, pick uh, Anupam, Manur and Megha Guru Prasad. So I think we've done five. Uh, so Megha, Anupam, uh, Sridhar, Bindusri, and Amit, congratulations, you get uh, a copy of the book. Uh, but let me just share the Takshashila thing uh, by way of closing. I think it's a, it's a good way to do this because we uh, encountering this uh, in ethical reasoning and other things, uh, we found that uh, this is the Kahneman uh, think, thinking fast and slow framework, uh, but we've done it in two dimensions and you can use any two dimensions. But what basically what happens is most of the time the brain is in the red zone, you know, uh, bounded 
it's it's jumping in instinctive uh, it's in the instinct mode whether it's economics or ethics or technology innovation politics so the brain is in the instinct mode right but you want the brain to really go into the reason mode uh, which is in the top right hand quadrant then the question is how you know how do you get there so we uh, we offer a simple framework called the uh, red red framework which says whenever you encounter a fact or a piece of information don't jump and react you know uh, reflect on it first take some time breathe in reflect on what 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 you're seeing second is you educate yourself uh, you know really find out whether you know the stuff uh, what you're talking about because if someone is talking about neurosurgery you know it's not for us to just wake up on the right side of the bed and offer an opinion right so educate yourself to the extent possible this is very easy on the net now and then third is you discuss this with people whom uh, who are your friends but not necessarily sharing the same opinion on everything you know you need to have diversity of friends who can disagree with you because so studies have found that while we are very good at defending our own views we are also very good at attacking other people's uh, views right so when you can have when you have friends who can uh, you know create a good atmosphere where you discuss where you're not in an echo chamber you will be able to go to the top right so this is our life hack uh, and i think it's something uh the 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 art of bitfulness definitely is a book that we can attach to this and offer as a as a supplement you know deeper read to uh, try and implement something because all we are trying to do here is to move from the bottom left to the top right you know where you can use reason uh, get mental calm to be able to reflect on your own lives and you know the things that we do but also more importantly reflect on social developments politics etc which as we know today are a extremely extremely challenging times right so all this change starts with us uh, throw your television out of the window uh, uh, throw your uh, you know phone into the modes which uh, nandan and tanuj told us uh, get into the create uh, curate and communicate mode and i think we will be able to make some positive steps in this direction of achieving mindful uh, bitfulness So on that note, thank you very much, Nandan and Tanuj, for being with us, for spending uh, time with us. We sort of uh, got the timing uh, scheduling wrong, but yeah, here we are. We spent a good one hour, ten minutes on this. Thank you, and the books will reach you guys uh, if you've given us your contact information. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nitin. It was a great session. Thanks a lot, and look forward to seeing you in person at Takshila.